Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, es freut mich, Sie an diesem denkwürdigen 8. Mai namens des Wiener Wiesenthal-Instituts bei der Simon Wiesenthal Lecture mit Hanna Jablonka begrüßen zu dürfen. Mein Name ist Bertrand Perz. Ich bin Historiker am Institut für Zeitgeschichte der Universität Wien und in einer, einer anderen Funktion Vorstandsmitglied des Wiener Wiesenthal-Instituts. In dieser Funktion äh, habe ich heute die Rolle des Gastgebers. Besonders freut es mich, hier heute den Botschafter der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Herrn Rünger, und die Gesandte der israelischen Botschaft, Frau Ronen, begrüßen zu dürfen. Das ist uns eine große Ehre. Ganz besonders begrüße ich unsere heutige Vortragende, Frau Jablonka, die Hanna Jablonka, I'm pleased to welcome you here in Vienna. Äh, meine Begrüßung verbindet sich zugleich mit einer Entschuldigung für die Abwesenheit des Geschäftsführers des Wiesenthal-Instituts, Dr. Raschki, sowie der Forschungskoordinatorin, äh, Frau Dr. Kovac, die beide sonst für die Lecture zuständig sind. Herr Raschki ist derzeit in den USA, die Forschungskoordinatorin, Frau Kovac, auf einer wissenschaftlichen Tagung. Das bildet auch ein Stück weit die Realität des Wiesenthal-Instituts ab. Äh, es ist auch ein mobiles Institut. Wir haben heute also eine etwas geänderte Vertretung des Instituts. Das betrifft auch die Moderation des heutigen Abends, die von einem Mitarbeiter des Wiesenthal-Instituts, äh, Herrn Philipp Rohrbach, übernommen wird. Er war in den letzten Jahren im Wiesenthal-Institut für die Digitalisierung und Nutzbarmachung der Holocaust-relevanten Archivbestände der israelitischen Kultusgemeinde zuständig und ist auch außerhalb des Instituts in verschiedenen Gedenkinitiativen und Forschungsprojekten tätig, unter anderem Leiter des Projekts The Austrian Heritage, ein Projekt zur digitalen Sammlung, Verbreitung und Vermittlung schriftlicher und mündlicher Erinnerungen von österreichisch-jüdischen Emigrantinnen in den USA und in Israel. Ich komme damit zu unserem heutigen Gast, Anna Jablonka. Sie wird zum Thema Survivors of the Holocaust in Israel, Image and Reality sprechen. Kollege Rohrbach wird Frau Jablonka vorstellen. Der Vortrag wird auf Englisch gehalten. Frau Jablonka versteht aber Deutsch und sie, das, das heißt, bei der Diskussion soll sie der englische Vortrag nicht daran hindern, ihre Fragen, wenn sie wollen, auch auf Deutsch zu stellen. Sollte es Probleme bei der Übersetzung geben, wird Herr Rohrbach selbstverständlich behilflich sein. Bevor ich nun Kollegen Rohrbach das Wort übergebe, noch auf ein Hinweis auf eine weitere Veranstaltung des Wiesenthal-Instituts vom 22. bis 24. Mai, also in zwei Wochen etwa, beginnt hier, die, hier in diesem Raum die internationale Tagung des Wiesenthal-Instituts mit dem Titel Storylines and Black Boxes, Konstellationen autobiografische Erzählungen über Gewalterfahrungen im Kontext des Zweiten Weltkrieges, ein Thema, das durchaus mit dem heutigen äh, in Verbindung stehen könnte. Äh, das Programm liegt, glaube ich, auf äh, und äh, wir würden uns über Ihren Besuch bei dieser Tagung sehr freuen. Ich danke Ihnen von meiner Seite nochmals ganz herzlich für Ihr Interesse am heutigen Vortrag, äh, der sicher äh, spannend sein wird und ich darf hiermit an den Kollegen Rohrbach übergeben. Dankeschön. Danke, Bertrand Perz, für die Eröffnungsworte. Dear Excellences, dear Ladies and Gentlemen, dear Colleagues, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies to our today's Simon Wiesenthal Lecture. I'm honored that I have the possibility to share today's event for you. And before Professor Joblonka starts with her lecture, it is my pleasure to briefly introduce her. Hannah Jablonke is an Israeli historian and scholar of the Holocaust. She received her PhD in 1990 at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The title of her dissertation is The Absorption of the Holocaust Survivors in the Emerging State of Israel and the Problems of the Integration in Israeli Society. Hannah Jablonke became Associated Professor in 2002 
She received her full professorship in 2009, and um, she's affiliated with the history department of the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Among, uh, among her many other affiliations, she's currently a member of the Yad Vashem Council and the historian of the Ghetto Fighters Museum. She was also the academic advisor of Yad Vashem's exhibition marking the 60th anniversary of the State of Israel. Professor Yablonka's research interests include the Holocaust in Central Europe, the Eichmann trial, and the cultural and social impact of the Shoah on Israeli society. Hannah Yablonka is the author of more than 40 scientific articles. She's the editor of four books and the author of several books, including Survivors of the Holocaust, Israel After the War. This is a book this is, which is also important for today's lecture, I guess. In 2004, she published The State of Israel versus Adolf Eichmann. And her last book was um, The Mizraim and the Shoah, published in 2008. Diana, we are very pleased that you accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. And uh, thank you for having me here. And thank you for everybody, everybody who came here, excellencies, dear crowd. Um, this is, of course, not a regular day to take this uh, lecture because it's the 8th of May. And besides the meaning it has to the world, which marks the end of Second World War, it has a personal meaning for me because that's the day my mother was liberated. And my mother is today, I think they're here? Oh, okay. My mother is today 98, and she's still very opinionated and very well preserved, although her life was not always milk and honey. Um, the story I want to tell you, first of all, is a very unique story. If you take the stories of many, many immigrations to other nations from an original land, the immigration of the survivors of the Holocaust into Israel, as I will show you, is a unique story in a comparative manner of analysis. But also, absolutely, it's a very, very unique story of which I want to tell you a few lines and a few very interesting facts today in my story and lecture. When I came, and that was the end of the 1980s, when I finished my master's degree, my father called me on our once a week coffee, and he said, well, I wish you would write your PhD on the story of the survivors of the Holocaust in Israel. Now, this is a very interesting story because as you will see the numbers in a second, um, most survivors after Second World War chose to immigrate to Palestine for many reasons, which I will tell you of later on. Uh, and so the story of the survivors of, of uh, the Shoah who um, went to Israel is a very uh, neglected story. I went to Yuda Bauer, who was my teacher, and I told him, Yuda, I want to write about this. Although it was the end of the 1980s, I am sure that there are at least 10 or 12 PhDs written on this. And I can still remember his reaction. He said, Hana, finally, there is a redemption to this topic. That means that until the late 80s, 1980s, nobody really thought that the story of the immigration of the survivors into the state of Israel, into the emerging state of Israel, was worth a real research, that it was a big saga, and it was. So this is the saga I want to tell you about today. Um, before I do so, so you will understand the numbers, in Israel of today, there are many myths about the survivors. And every Yom HaShoah, there is uh, this almost perpetual and, and returning phenomena when the television goes to one randomly cho chosen survivor of the Holocaust. They open his refrigerator, they show how the refrigerator is empty, and how the state of Israel neglects the survivors. This is almost a ritual. Well, you have to define 
who is a survivor in the Holocaust, in order for me to tell you that this is a myth, because unfortunately, all I have to tell you is a big story of winners, and I don't have of real winners, which I will prove in a second. Now, the myth goes on. The myth goes on to describe a group of people who are traumatized, a group of people who were silent, who never spoke about what they went through, poor, as I told you about the empty refrigerator, and of course, very scarred and helpless people. Let me tell you that none of this has anchored in reality. Actually, the story is completely different. And you can turn every subject that I just told you and say the opposite, and you will see the basics of my lecture. Now, who is a survivor? Um, I, will, I have a definition. A survivor is the Jews of continental Europe who suffered anti-Nazi occupation or influence, both directly camps, ghettos, forced labor, partisans hiding, or indirectly that they had to escape, they were expelled, or they were deported. Let me tell you how I formed this definition, because actually this is a topic that I was pioneering, so I had to find a definition. Whom am I researching? I went to the definition that was relevant to the first year of the Second World War. Today, to a large extent, under the Israeli developing discourse and under the influence of the fact that the Shoah became the center of Israeli national identity, Everybody is basically a survivor of the, of the Holocaust, because it also means sometimes financial uh, meaning. I heard Rav Lau, in, like a couple of weeks ago, we appeared together, and he said to young students of high school, you are also survivors of the Holocaust. Well, I'm not a survivor of the Holocaust. I had a great childhood, and um, I agreed to be part of that uh, event. I never suffered in my life. I don't know what it is to suffer that kind of a suffering. So basically, I took two criteria. I took one criteria at the end of the 1940s who viewed themselves as survivors of the Holocaust, who viewed themselves as suffering through Second World War events that happened to the Jews. The second criteria was who was viewed as a survivor of the Holocaust by the old Yishuv. That means the Jews who immigrated to Palestine before the Shoah. Now you must remember that in the 1940s, it was not such a big privilege to be considered a survivor of the Holocaust. So somebody who defined himself like that at that time, and somebody who was viewed like that at that time, meant a price to be paid to a certain extent. So I'm going to the Heulic, the embryotic definition of survivors, and as you can see, I don't include the Ebezrahi Jews under the term of survivors of the Holocaust. My story starts at the beginning, and the beginning is the end of Second World War. Now, I want to define something very important. The end of Second World War is not the same like in what we call in Israel the general history. General history, we say that Second World War started on the 1st of September 1939 and ended on May 8th, 1945. But for the Jewish, and in the Jewish historiography, or in the Jewish narrative of the survivors, the war ended in a very flexible date, dating from around February of 1944, when the first Jews were liberated as the Red Army was going from the east to the west, and ended up by the end of May of 1945. Every time on this span of time is the time war ended for the Jews, and that's the way they told their stories in Palestine. So one of the dates for many Jews of liberation was, of course, January of 1945, when Warsaw was liberated by the Soviets. I chose this par uh, these paragraphs that come from a letter that Itzhak Zuckerman, who was the deputy of Mordechai Nilevich, the commander of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, describes this day. 
Now, there is a specific meaning for me, after we read the relevant paragraph here, to note to you what is the difference of V-Day in the memory of the Europeans and the Day of Liberation for the survivors. These are two very different concepts. Okay, I'm going to the second paragraph. They, he, and, she, he and Sylvia, his wife, heard that the Soviets are in Warsaw and Warsaw is liberated and they went down to the street. I remember vividly the day when the dog Sylvia and I went to the square. We saw the Soviet tanks and the tank men on the pinnacles that their faces were solid black from the suit. And around them, everyone was gleeful. Women, children, and men blowing kisses and flowers. And suddenly, for the first time, I felt like I couldn't stand. Now, you must understand what Yitzhak Zuckerman been through until that day. He flew Warsaw and decided to go back to the ghetto. So he lived in the ghetto for three years. Then he commanded the uprising. Then he heard, like, uh, half a year before the uprising, he heard that all his family in Vilna was murdered. Now, with this, he comes to this day in January, and this is the day where he cannot stand anymore. So you can grasp what it means, Day of Liberation, and let me tell you, I read hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of survivors, and the Day of Liberation, so-called, which sounds really big, the Day of Liberation was the saddest day of their lives. This day, January 15th, was the saddest day of my life. I wanted to cry, not from happiness, but from grief. The kissing, I'm passing two lines, the kissing tank drivers, the blown flowers towards them, the joyful crowd, the freedom feeling and redemption, and us, Sylvia, the dog and I, standing among the crowd, lonely, orphaned, lusts, and know very well that there is no Jewish people anymore. What joy can possibly be? If you compare this to the pictures, the iconic pictures that you know, about the sailor kissing the nurse at the Times Square, about the Glenn Miller Orchestra, about the, the confetti in, in, in Paris, nothing like that symbolizes the starting point of the day after in the life of the survivors of the Holocaust. This was not victory. This was the biggest defeat the Jewish people have ever experienced. With this in mind, actually, the natural feeling, the natural sentiment, the natural state of mind that could have been relevant was despair. And what you will see now is really a strong battle against despair and a very, very strong crowd trying to rebuild. What were the questions? Just three weeks before this event, the liberation of Warsaw, some of the Jews who were already released gathered together in Lublin. Lublin was the temporary capital city of Poland before Warsaw was liberated. And they had a few questions in mind. Now that we are liberated, now that each one of us feels that he is the last Jew, that there were uh, Jewish states like Warsaw and Vilna that don't exist anymore, there are a few questions we have to uh, talk about them within us. So the questions were, what now? This is a very normal question to, for somebody who has no home to go to, who has no family to go to. But the question embodies one more question, a sub-question. What now meant the basic question of, should we leave Poland now? And if so, when and where? And if I can interpret that question, should we go to Palestine right now, or should we stay in Poland? And there were two ideologies. If I say, by the way, names that you don't know, please stop me. The first was Abba Kovner, who was part of that discussion. Abba Kovner was the head of the underground at the Vilna Ghetto. And he said, 
We are living now. And the destination is Palestine. We have nothing to do here. We have to go to Palestine. We have to rebuild the national home. And the second was Yitzhak Zuckerman. And Yitzhak Zuckerman said, no, we dreamed all our life to go to Palestine. But we have to stay here because we have an historical responsibility. Because I have a feeling that there will be, we will have more Jews to come. And somebody has to face them. Somebody has to introduce them. Somebody has to take care of them. And as you know, history minister is a very harsh judge and a very punctual judge. And history uh, made its judgment. It was Yitzhak Zuckerman who stayed, against his will, by the way, against his natural wish. Yitzhak Zuckerman who stayed was right because Jews came. And Yitzhak Zuckerman, who was at the right place and the right time, taking leadership, actually made the masses of the Polish Jews who came from Russia and who stayed also in Poland. I will give you in a minute the numbers. And he created a strong, vivid, big national movement. Hasn't it been for Yitzhak Zuckerman, this would have been a crowd dispersed. Now let me give you the numbers. Before the war, there were three and a half million Polish Jews. When the war ended on the soil of Poland, there were 70,000 Jews. That's it. Then there are about 200,000 Jews from Poland who escaped to the Soviet Union and returned. So we have about a quarter of a million Polish Jews survivors. Most of them, due to this decision of Yitzhak Zuckerman, made their way to Palestine. The second question, of course, is revenge. This is the basic instinct, which is written even in the Bible, in the Bible an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. You don't see revenge in the Jewish conduct after the Second World War. Revenge in the meaning that we understand going to Germany, killing a thousand Germans, and feeling good about yourself and about justice being done. No revenge. The revenge will come later in this phenomenal expression of the revenge through redemption. I mean, in the creation of the Jewish state, this was the revenge of redemption. They wanted to kill us. They wanted to wipe us from the face of the, the earth. They did not succeed, on the contrary. Well, to a certain extent, by the way, historically they succeeded, biologically and demographically. This seminar that we call is actually to explain to you all the dilemmas and all the answers given after the war. Now I want to give you some numbers. Uh, all in all, we have more than half a million survivors of the Holocaust who immigrated to Palestine from 1945 until the end of the 1950s. Um, I'm, I'm just showing you a little bit, a profile, some elements of the profile of the survivors. As you can see here, I have the ages. This is, as, as we may call, the normal Israeli uh, um, population uh, age range. That is a, um, a population that was not uh, influenced by the Shoah. You can see the numbers. Now let me tell you two explanations to these numbers. The most vulnerable age groups in the Shoah were the children, which is the second age group from 5 to 14. This is what we call a million and a half uh, Jewish kids that were murdered in the Shoah. This is a biological blow immense biological blow on the Jewish people because these children will never grow up, will never have children, will never have offsprings. And you can see in a normal population between five and 14, you have almost 17%. Now you can see all the countries of the Shoah and you see less than 50% of the normal uh, expulsion. So this is one, a no children, in the population of the survivors. The second is, of course, the old age. Now, you know that old age shifted because today 60 is the new 50, but 
Here we are still in the, in the old counting, and you can see the blow in this age. Except for the Romanian Jews, which were comparatively intact, but basically this was the second most vulnerable age. But that means something else. Besides the tragedy of the children, that means that you can see what happens between the age 15 and 44. Which is, if, you, if I want to say it in another words, which is the age of the working power, of the breeding power, having children, and of course, the, the dream of every country who absorbs immigration. The young people at the right age who will have children, who will work, and in the, in the circumstances of Palestine at that time, who can also go to the army. So you can see these numbers from here, and you can see a dramatic concentration of the survivors in those ages. To a large extent, this is one of the reasons why they made it so well, actually, in the state of Israel. Now, let me show you some other numbers. Uh, these are the Yusalia, the children who came, like, from the ages. Uh, you can see uh, the numbers, no mother, no father. Uh, having both parents you can have here, this is one of the um, um, indications, and I want to show you one more. Um, Yusalia by, by country. Can you read those numbers if I don't explain them? Uh, for instance, um, those who went under atrocities, these are children, so you can understand the demogra demography of this wave of immigration. You can see that in the Czechoslovakia, 50% um, went through some kind of uh, trauma. In Germany, of course, this is a different story, I will not go, but all in Western Hungary, Hungary, you can see that more than 50% went through uh, uh, some kind of trauma. You can see the story of the Polish children. This is basically, in numbers, the story of the tragedy. Now here you have the total numbers. All in all, I made them round. Of course, they didn't come with a zero, zero, zero. I made it uh, easy for you to grasp. Over half a million of survivors of the Holocaust immigrated the state of Israel uh, until the beginning of the 1950s. I, I want to say it in another way. Uh, at the beginning of the state, one of every three Israeli was a survivor of the Holocaust. This is not only a, a a quantity. This is, to a large extent, an entity. Now, to give you, I would like now, I need now your help. Uh, it worked differently. Uh, I want to show you just two minutes of one survivor of the Holocaust. And you can see the way he speaks. He went to a big trauma in the, in the Lodge ghetto. And you can see what he does in Israel today. His name is Judah Sternfeld. And, uh, okay. yeah, sure. It's a, it's a state. 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 It's a לשמוע <laughs> הם לא הספיקו להקים משפחה, לא הספיקו להשאיר שורש. כמו שבאו מהשואה, נכנסו למלחמת קומוניות ונפלו. ביקשתי מקרן קיימת, תעשו עץ על כל איש 
אמרו, אנחנו לא רק נוסעי יער, אנחנו נוסעי אנדרטה גם כן. הרגשתי את ישראל היפה. הקימו אתר אינטרנט עם כל ההיסטוריה של כל נוק... I brought you this uh, paragraph just to show you uh, two elements. The first is something that you, you hear from the people themselves about their past, with what did they come to Israel. This is a rather recent film, so you understand that he was a very young man when he immigrated to Palestine, but he had a history. And then you can see how actually, to a large effect, many survivors are doing Initiations in Israel, he is doing the initiation of remembering those soldiers from the Shoah who fell with no family to remember. Now, I want to show you two pictures. And um, this, of course, uh, is, there, is there somebody here from Hungary who has an Hungarian affiliation? Okay. Um, uh, I will put this picture in a context in a second, but this is actually the prototype of the new Israeli. Suli. And it was painted at the beginning of the 1950s by a survivor of the Holocaust from Hungary. His name is Kariel Gardosh, or as he known in Israeli, Dosh. There are all elements of Israelism in it. And just one more picture. This was painted by Naftali Bezem, another survivor of the Holocaust. You can see here the worker with the number on his arm, which very much symbolizes the 1950s. There are three elements of identity in the lives of the survivors. The one is that they are survivors. The second is they are immigrants. Immigration, by the way, is not a, not a small trauma. And the third one is that they are Israelis, but in a very, very special way. Now, you must remember that most of them came together with the creation and the establishment of the State of Israel. And unlike any other immigration that I know, From the very first meaning, they felt that they came to their home and they became the backbone in many fields, the creator and establishers of many fields in the state of Israel. Now, I will work on these four periods. The first one is the first period pre-state, which I gave you already some numbers. The second is mass immigration to Palestine, to Israel after it was established. And that's during the War of Independence. Many survivors came through the War of Independence. This is also, to a large extent, unique in the history of immigrations. The third is the 1950s, when they are the creators and the establishers of the new Israelism and the Israeli culture. And then I will talk to you about the last period after the Eichmann trial, when they became the backbone, really, of the Israeli society. Now, let's start with immigrants. Where are the survivors Zionists? Um, it's a difficult question, but I have an answer. In 1939, most European Jews were not Zionists. Zionist was not the prevalent movement among the Jews of Europe. After the war, most survivors, and I have to say that very clearly, chose to immigrate to Palestine and then Israel. The choice is a very important element here because in 1948, the United States opens its gate to the survivors. And yet, most of them, unlike in the big immigration at the end of the 8080s, unlike then, most survivors choose to immigrate to Palestine rather than to the United States. Now, what kind of a Zionism was it? Well, it wasn't this classical Zionism, because classical Zionism means creating a new society, a new human personality. It had all kinds of social aspirations. They did not have any social aspirations. But they had what I may call an instinctive gut reaction Zionism, meaning that because we didn't have a homeland, because we didn't have a state, we were killed the way we were killed. So basically, the existence of a Jewish state is an existential issue for us. There is no other place that we will be the majority society, and there is no other solution for the Jewish people rather than a state. Not the Bund, not the socialist idea, not any other ideology that was 
playing the role before Second World War. These all, these all theories were not proven right under the shadow of the Shoah. So this is a kind of an existential Zionist with which they came. For most survivors, even if you speak with them today, and you ask them, they will tell you that maybe this is not the way we dreamed the state will turn out to be, it doesn't matter. This was for us the salvation of a soul. We never took it for granted, and we don't take it for granted 70 years after it was existed. Now, with this coming in mind, they also took part in the War of Independence. Half of the soldiers of the Israeli armed force in the War of Independence were survivors of the Holocaust. Almost 1,800 survivors of the Holocaust died in the War of Independence, which is, a, if you want, a double tragedy. Nevertheless, this is a tragedy. But nevertheless, this gave them the feeling that no other immigration has that from the first moment they set a foot on the new land, they felt they are the owners. And they can demand, and they can shape, and they can say what they want. So this is the element of immigration. Now, Israelis, of course, these are the parameters of being an Israeli, being a part of the economy, having Sabra kids, native kids, shaping the culture, and of course the military. I brought you a picture of one of the survivors who died at the War of Independence. He comes from actually Czechoslovakia. I don't know if that's unconsciously, because <laughs> that's my origin. Um, he came and you can see he was 19 when he fell, uh, when, he was died, when he died at the War of Independence. You can see his picture, Moshe Zellinger. Uh, actually, they didn't know much about him only his age and name, and that's how he is remembered. But there is now a whole project which Yuda Sternfeld, the survivor we just heard, uh, is in, has initiated by which on the Independence Day and Memorial Day, uh, these uh, graves are being uh, visited by high school, teacher, uh, high school students. This is also something very interesting. At the War of Independence, there were only 12 um, higher honorable uh, soldiers decorated with the highest uh, bravery um, symbol. Only 12. Four of them were survivors of the Holocaust, and also the decoration itself was uh, designed by a survivor of the Holocaust. And you can see, I guess you understand what you see here. You can see here a replica of the Star of David. You can see here a branch of uh, an olive, which means peace. And you can see here the yellow background, which goes, of course, to the yellow star the Jews had to wear. And this is the War of Independence. That's the beginning of the state, when Shoah and independence, in a way, played mingling, although independence was more uh, estimated or appreciated. Now I go to the survivors. Let me first tell you something that is very important. In the 1950s, the survivors are building their homes. They are having children. They are finding jobs without families of parents, because most of them did not have parents. They are integrating into the new homeland. And you can trace something very interesting, two parallel lines in the activities of the survivors. Parallel by, me, by which I mean two lines that don't meet. The one line is penetrating strongly to every niche in Israeli society they could hold on and, and immigrate and integrating into society while shaping Israelism. The second parallel line is, of course, keeping the memory of the Shoah. Now, these two lines in their activities are very intensive lines. However, in the 1950s, they are completely two different lines of action. Don't meet. I want to tell you something about the myth of the silence of the survivors. 
The survivors were never silent. From the first minute the war ended, actually also during the war itself, they wrote, they documented, they collected documentation, they spoke, they spoke in many words. You can speak not only with words, by the way, you can speak also by art, by literature. They were documenting their past intensively. Now, when Yad Vashem, no, I, will show, I, I want to tell you first this. The first Holocaust museum ever in the world was created by survivors of the Holocaust. It's the Lohamea Getaot Museum. It was created in 1949. This is very different from Yad Vashem because we know there are two kinds of museums. One museum that is coming from grassroots, that means as an initiation of survivors coming and growing up. And there are museums that are state-oriented by law. Like for instance, Yad Vashem was established by law that the Knesset passed, the Israeli parliament. These are very, two very different kinds of museums. The first museum of Holocaust in the world was a grassroots initiation of survivors of the Holocaust. And that was Lohamea Getaot, 1949. What they did at first, and they were very poor, because it's a kibbutz that was created only by survivors. They collected money. On the day they went on the soil of, the, of where the kibbutz was erected, they made the cornerstone for the museum. And then immediately they sent, with all money they had, they sent somebody to Europe to collect materials. By 1950, they already had a periodical giving research about the Shoah. This is one outstanding information. In the Hebrew Gymnasium of Jerusalem, in 1947, came somebody by the name of Arya Bauminger as a teacher. He knew Hebrew from Europe. And he was having an after ex-curriculum uh, event with the students three times a week, telling them about the Shoah. And the students of the gymnasium came three times a week to study what he had to tell them. It was stopped only because he was enlisted to the War of Independence. Now, when Yad Vashem was established, the first department at Yad Vashem was the Department of Oral History, of Testimonies, 1952. 1954, it was erected. A Jewish survivor from Poland, Rachel Oyerbach, collected almost 3,000 testimonies by survivors. Most of the witnesses at the Eichmann trial came from what she collected. Now, at that time, the tape recorder was not in the size of a matching box or on your iPhone. It was those big machines with, with kind of ribbons going and then to, to write them down, it was terrible. And she collected 3,000 testimonies. That means that 3,000 survivors came to testify. This is an unbelievable, and I'm just giving you examples of many, many other things of the deep involvement of survivors into the commemoration of the Shoah. The second thing is legislation. I told you, unlike any other immigrants, immediately they felt at home. Some of the most important laws in Israel of the 1950s were initiation of the survivors of the Holocaust. I would like to refer to two of them the Nazi and Nazi Collaborators Punishment Law. I could give you a lecture only about this, but I want to tell you that this is a phenomenon that is really interesting. We were speaking previously about revenge. And to a large extent, some of the revenge uh, was aimed at other Jews who were functionaries under a Nazi occupation. That means Kapos, Judenrats, Jewish militia, they were complaining about each other. He was a kapo in the camp I was. And because of her, my mother died because she hit her on the hand when she wanted to take the bottom of the soup because it had more food in it. And the Israeli law system did not know what to do. And so it happened eventually that this law was enacted in the Knesset, you can see as early as 1950. And pay attention to the name of the law, Nazi and Nazi collaborators. Who are the collaborators? 
Basically, the legislator knew that the collaborators are those uh, functionaries under Jewish, um, under Nazi occupation. We, I, I, when I looked an, into this topic and I researched it, I found 50 trials against Jews in Israel in the 1950s. Uh, about two thirds of them were convicted. One was even sentenced to death. The second that I want to show you is, of course, this, the Shoah and Heroism Memorial Day. This is also an initiative of the survivors. So basically, a state-oriented remembrance of the Shoah is an initiation of newcomers, new immigrants, to a new state. This is unprecedented. No other example can be found. Now, I show you, showed you a little bit of, of, of this, of the collecting testimony, the Lohamea Getaot. Let me just give you a one word about memorial books. About 150 uh, books of uh, commemorizing all kinds of Jewish communities were published in the 1950s, all of them financed by the survivors. Um, I teach in Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva is the capital of the south of Israel. And it is considered usually to be a city uh, where most uh, immigrants from uh, the East came, from Morocco, from Tunisia, etc. But the first comers to Be'er Sheva were survivors of the Holocaust, immediately after it was conquered in 1949. And when you come to Be'er Sheva, the first thing you will see on, almost on the, on the main road is the synagogue to remembering the martyrs of Auschwitz. And you look at the, at the synagogue, and I went into the history of the synagogue. It was established in 1954 54, by survivors who collected one lira to another lira, and they built up this synagogue as commemoration of their communities. It's not the only one. There are at least five synagogues like that in Be'er Sheva. But this is a small indication of what was going on in this whole field of remembering the Holocaust and preserving the heritage of that event. This is one of the books by Shaul Friedlander, his biographical book. I, 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 I think there are hundreds of uh, biographies of survivors published during the years in Israel. This is in English. This is, this is Lohamea Getaot, the museum. Okay. I, will, I think I'll skip that and I'll go on. I'm going now to the 1960s. This is, by the way, on the eve of the 1960s, the survivors, as I told you, succeeded in putting a law in the Knesset commemorating the Shoah. Now, my students always ask me, tell me, Hannah, only in the late 1950s, Israel remembered to make a law to remember the Shoah? That was 1959. And I tell them, do you know when a law to remember the soldiers of the, of the wars of Israel was enacted? And they say no, because they don't, they don't know most of the things I asked them. Um, and then they said, I told them, listen, it was 1964. So basically, it was a group of newcomers that succeeded in making a law giving a national recognition for their plight that preceded the national plight in acting the law. Did, did you understand what I was saying? They preceded five years. They succeeded in having a day acknowledging their plight five years before the National Day of Atonement for those soldiers who fell for the nation. This is the symbol of the Yom HaShoah in Israel ever since. Um, this was uh, in 61, it was uh, a choreographed, uh, by the way, also by a survivor of the Holocaust, and it says, it's like a fire, and it says, Shema Israel, which is the famous Israeli. Now, as I told you at the beginning, um, to a large extent, the Shoah became the backbone of Israeli national identity. This is also something unprecedented. When a group of immigrants succeeds, that its message and heritage becomes the backbone of the national identity. This is unheard of. And this goes to three stages 
of the way the survivors spoke with the Israeli society. And the six stages are the epistemological stages of information, knowledge, and awareness. Let me explain those. In the first years, the late 40s and the 1950s, the survivors brought information. They told, they spoke everywhere in their own way. But it was left only on the level of information. It was not transformed in the mind of the Israelis into knowledge. There is a big difference between information and knowledge. I can give you the example that I always use. And the example that I always use is the 1973 Yom Kippur War in Israel, when the intelligence gave the information. The whole Egyptian army is on the Suez Canal. The whole Syrian army is up there in the north. But there was no knowledge of war, which ended up in the big surprise of the 6th of October, 1973. And as much as an experience is remote from our human experiences that we know, from the repertoire that we already know, the more it is remote, then the more time it needs for information to turn to knowledge. So the first 13 years are information. The survivors spoke, they told their story, but you heard the story of Vilna, you heard the story of Warsaw, you heard the story of Lvov, but you didn't have a knowledge of what actually was the Shoah. The knowledge, the information was turned into knowledge at the Eichmann trial. Now let me tell you just one more thing about this. What was the essence of the Eichmann trial for the public? The testimonies of the survivors. And the testimonies of the survivors at the Eichmann trial, each one of them telling his geographical place, and suddenly the whole of Europe was in the story. Suddenly, at this moment, the Israelis knew the Shoah, understood the essence of the event. Now, I will skip that, because I, I think I have a problem in time. This is Chaim Guri. Chaim Guri is the laureate poet poet of Israel, and he was the reporter, the most famous reporter of the Eichmann trial. And he understood in the beginning of the 1960s, he understood the shift from information to knowledge. And see what he says. We knew these things, didn't we? Yes, we knew. Even before the Eichmann trial, we knew scholars and historians, etc., etc. There was Yad Vashem, Lochamei Agetaot, and I'm going to the last paragraph. But when this material was taken to the prosecution table and became part of the indictment, when those documents broke out of the silence of the archives, it was as if they were now speaking for the first time, and this knowledge was very different from the knowledge. This process released a tremendous energy of now I understand kind. From here on, everything changed. Now, after knowledge, we have to have awareness. What is awareness? In Hebrew, by the way, it sounds, this is the only thing that in Hebrew sounds maybe better. It's meidai yediyayin toda. When awareness comes, that means that the event we are speaking of becomes the compass by which we estimate our exist, uh, existential situation and condition and by which we make our existential decisions. And suddenly, we are in the realm of Shoah awareness. Everything that Israel experiences today is basically viewed in the vision or through the perspective of the Shoah. And many of its existential decisions are also weighed through the possibility of a Shoah. This is awareness. So let me show you a few examples of what happened after the Ahmed trial. And let me tell you just this. It was the survivors who made this difference. And I am not sure, as I will show you at the end, and I'm not sure whether they didn't go one bridge too far in that success. Gideon Hausner was the prosecutor of the Eichmann trial, 
and see what he says in letters. He was a celebrity after the trial and he got all kinds of letters and see what he says to the IDF and also uh, to private people. We all must share the notion of the great Holocaust and the lesson to be drawn from it as to the Jews holding on to their land. And in another briefing to the foreign ministry, he says, there is absolutely no reason to believe that the Shoah will not reoccur somewhere else. We are bound to hold on to this land, preserve it, develop it, and support every stone and every rock because it's the ultimate safe haven. And the best example of what awareness is, is by Giv Oli, who was the head it's here, yes, it was the head of the educational branch in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. The Shoah shapes, now you can understand, our national consciousness and the ways by which we understand ourselves and the world in which we live. That means that the state of Israel basically was reduced to one thing, to be a safe haven to the Jews God forbid will such a Shoah re repeat itself. Now I want to go at the last, uh, at the end of what I have to say. I'm okay? Okay. <laughs> because I, I really don't want to, to take your questions. Um, uh, to what is uh, the situation in the last couple of years? Um, you know that Auschwitz became a very visited site for many Israelis, and one of the most famous sites um, was the Israeli pilots. Israeli pilots actually, to a large extent, absorbing and internalizing the message of most survivors, as it was told without meaning. The Israeli pilots, when they flew over Auschwitz, that is what they had to say. We, the pilots of the Israeli Air Force, over the skies of Auschwitz, born out of the ashes of millions of victims, carries us their muted cry, salute their bravery, and vow to be the protector of the Jewish people and its country, Israel. That means, basically, that the Shoah, as an awareness-performing event, ceases to look only upon the citizens of Israel as Israel's responsibility, but basically breaks all the demographical boundaries of Israel. Israel is now the Jewish people as a whole. Israel has responsibility for the Jewish people as a whole. Now, this is even more important. Every three years, the Gutmann Institute makes uh, surveys of public opinion. And they ask the same question, as you will see here. Now, I must explain to you this. 98% and 98 consensus among Israelis is unheard of. If, they, if you have two Jews, they have two different synagogues. You know that's the case that was in, uh, in Afghanistan. Only two Jews were left and they had two different synagogues. Israelis argue about everything. But 98% of Jewish Israelis believe that to remember the Shoah is the most important principle that should guide the state. Do you know of any precedent in other immigrations that they succeeded in bringing their message as to a complete, almost 100% consensus? In similar polls, by the way, from the 1960s and the 1970s, the state was ranked first. That means that the state and Zionism were to a large extent, overthrown by the Shoah as an awareness uh, element, and Shoah only third. Second came the last war before the poll of nine, in 1964, five, I'm sorry, it was the War of Independence, 68, the Six Day War uh, of 67, and in 1974, the 73 war was the second. The Shoah became the center of Israeli explanation for everything, and of course, the most important issue to take into account uh, when uh, weighing its existential position. Now, in order to bring back the survivors, and I told you that to a large extent it was one bridge too far, in 2002, there was the last gathering 
international gathering of survivors in the world. I don't think that such a gathering will happen again because most survivors uh, internationally cannot make the journey anymore. And also the Israeli survivors are not getting younger by the day. And this was the last big gathering. And in that gathering, they um, wrote a kind of a legacy for the young people to come and follow them. I will not read with you the whole legacy. I just picked up two paragraphs, which I want to read with you. 80,000 survivors signed on that, um, on that legacy. That means 80, 80. Uh, so that means that basically this is their message for posteriority. I think it's very important to listen. It's very important to listen in Israel. It's very important to listen here. It's very important to listen everywhere because these people really built up themselves. They, uh, they succeeded in everything they did and they succeeded in bringing on their message and legacy of the, what even Abu Mazen said a week ago is the greatest tragedy human being has ever suffered. The memory of the Shoah is contentious and dark, exposing the ugly and naked face of consummate inhumanity that threatens the very nature and structure of civilization itself. We, who staggered through the valley of death, only to see how our families, our communities, and our people were destroyed, did not descend into this potency and despair. Remember, we started with despair. Rather, we struggled to extract a message of meaning and renewed purpose for our people and for all people, namely, a message of humanity, of human decency, and of human dignity. The Holocaust, which established the standard for absolute evil, is the universal heritage of all civilized people. The lessons of the Holocaust must form the cultural code for education towards humane values, democracy, human rights, tolerance, and patience, and opposition to racism and totalitarianism ideologies. From Har HaZikaron, this is the final sentence, in Jerusalem, the words of Rabbi Hillel need to ring out loud and clear. What is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow human beings. I think that by turning the way from despair where we started, and this very human universalistic message, it's a very good place to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting speech. The audience, we have approximately 20 minutes time for our discussion. The floor is open for your questions and comments. I want to ask you, in your book on the Eichmann trial, I, I found... Where is it coming from? Uh, from here. Ah. In your book for, um, on the Eichmann trial, I found the most precise description of the testimony of Moritz Fleischmann, who was the only survivor from Vienna who spoke at this trial. And I knew his son and I know some correspondence, so I know how, what a controversial and problematic personality he was. So I, I, I would like to know, do you have an idea why Leo Landau, who, who lived in Tel Aviv and who gave a testimony, a written death testimony to the Balkaduri collection in Yad Vashem, why Rachel Auerbach never considered to get in touch with him or other people around her who tried to find the, the final list of the survivors? And thank you. Each question at the time. Um, the, the decision, first of all, uh, Rachel Auerbach was not responsible for uh, the, cho uh, the choice of the witnesses at the admin trial. Uh, I'll go there. Okay. Rachel Auerbach was not responsible to choose the witnesses at the admin trial. It was the prosecution. Uh, the first the police and then the prosecution. Uh, and the decision was that uh, from every country there will be one uh, witness, because otherwise uh, I think the trial would have gone until today. Um, besides which, there were a couple of topics to be represented. Uh, 
I spoke in Israeli television, by the way, continue the question uh, about Mermelstein. Mermelstein was also from Vienna. Uh, and he was the last um, Judenrat älteste in uh, Theresienstadt. And he should have been summoned to testify because he was actually the only person who was in contact with Eichmann for six years, ever since Austria was conquered and until the end of the war because at Ghetto Theresienstadt Eichmann had a say, a strong say. And he was not called for testi testimony. There were many reasons why people were not called for testimony. The first one was the limitation that each state should be represented only uh, by one man. And the second is that they don't bring the Jewish functionaries issue on trial because this laundry should be cleaned up within the Jewish society and not vis-a-vis -vis the world. It's a harsh saying, but uh, that was what the documents showed us. You said that emigration of survivors, you, you show that it stopped somewhere in the 50s, but uh, the emigrants from the Soviet Union came in the 70s, 80s. How much of them, how many of them were survivors? And what was their impact on life in Israel? Um, that is one of the reasons I started with my definition of survivors. Um, I know that when um, poverty is described among survivors today, uh, most of them are from the Soviet Union. They are new immigrants. They immigrated at a relatively older age because the, most of them immigrated in the 1990s. So you can make the account yourself how old they were. When immigrating in an old age, usually it means uh, economical difficulties. Now, I don't think that all survivors from the Soviet Union no, from Russia, because the Soviet Union does not exist anymore. From Russia are survivors of the Holocaust. The Nazis never conquered Moscow, etc., etc. Uh, and those who came from the Baltic countries, who constitute part of the USSR, immigrated, many of them, in the late 40s and in the 1950s. However, in the current uh, more dominant Israeli um, discourse, they are considered to be survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, many of them are veterans of the Soviet Union, of, this, of the Red Army, and they succeeded, first of all, in uh, putting a law in the Knesset, which was never there before, marking the 8th of May. It, as funny as it might sound, uh, Israel never thought that the 8th of May is such an important date, so it was not actually mentioned in Israel. In the last 15 years, you see that it's a holiday for some people. You see all those generals from the Red Army with tons of medals and they marching in the streets. It's very, very nice. And actually, it's a big day, the 8th of May. Uh, but they really don't influence so much the issue of the Holocaust remembrance. What they do influence is the discussion over the definition of who is a survivor and, of course, the, the big discussion about Israel taking care of its survivors and not neglecting them uh, to starve. Thank you. Uh, how can you reconcile this very humanistic and universal message of the Holocaust survivors, of the actual Holocaust survivors, on the one hand, and, and the view of the political uh, leadership uh, of Israel as the ultimate safe haven and all that it implies, the, the camp mentality and the rights that spring from that and so forth. How, how can you reconcile that? Okay. Uh, first, let me tell you something about the Eichmann trial. Uh, when Eichmann was brought to Israel and his, the, way, the fact that he's there was, became a common knowledge when Ben-Gurion announced his uh, capture, 
suddenly there was a whole explosion in the newspapers. Some of it related to what we should do to him. And uh, I don't want even to share with you the ideas of what many Israelis thought to do to him. However, the largest cry against touching one hair of his head came from survivors. This is Yitzhak Zuckerman, whom we, we just met. I'm quoting him, but he was one of many, many survivors who wrote also to the papers, to the press. He said, if I would be now in an apartment and there would be a fire in the second room and Eichmann would be in that room, I would be the first to jump and save his life. When Eichmann was already sentenced to death by the Israeli court and his clemency was denied, Ben-Gurion and the president received a letter from Martin Buber and Ernst Bergman, some of them coming from the Czech Republic, uh, and Ernst Simon, and three survivors of the Holocaust. One of them was Katsetnik, which, which, whose testimony was the most unforgettable in the Eichmann trial. And they beseeched, they pleaded not to kill Eichmann for many reasons. So basically, the attitude of many survivors was the attitude of the good, old, what they believed is the European liberalism in which they grew up. This is the first thing. It's like what we call Kinderstub. The second is that basically they, they felt that the Shoah as an event, um, what, what our answer as human beings to the Shoah should be is not what we have to say to the, uh, to the other nations, what you did to us, how you killed us, what harms did you cause us. This is not interesting. The main lesson they took from the Shoah, many of them, is what it obliges us as survivors. If it happened to us, it obliges me much more than anybody else. And what does it oblige me? It obliges me exactly what Rabbi Hillel said. What you hate that is done to you, don't do to others. I have spoken in, I've been doing research on survivors of the Holocaust for the last 25 years. And I spoke to thousands of them, really. And it always comes the same. First of all, I look in my home. How do I look? How do I stand this ultimate test of the Shoah? Not how others. I don't care about the others. I care about the society in which I live. I, w I want also to tell you a personal story. Again, my mother, it's her liberation day. My mother, after she finished, uh, she, she li was liberated, she came back, she lost her first husband, she lost her parents, she lost the sister, she lost el ev almost everything. She, she, by then, had four years of medical studies. And uh, she was expelled from the university due to numerous clauses. And when she came back, she was really desperate. And then she knew there's only two alternatives. Either she kills herself, or she will go back to study. And she went back to study, to finish her studies. And then she immigrated to Palestine, and she became the district medical doctor, by which she established the medical services for the Bedouins. These are um, Israeli uh, Muslims. Nomads, not anymore, but they used to be. And in one interview she was asked, how come you, who have a number on your arm, how come you uh, um, created the, the uh, medical services for the Bedouins? And she said, it's not in spite of the Shoah. It's because of the Shoah. And this is such an important lesson. But she's not the only one. I just know her stories so well, so I can tell them all the time. But it's really there. And I hope that answers your question. I would like <clears throat> to ask you about uh, the other part. Uh, you always uh, talk about the survivors. Uh, and from uh, 
the perspective of here, uh, it's not quite uh, commonplace to know who were all the other people who were not the survivors who uh, impregnated the Israeli uh, uh, reality. Is there, uh, is, uh, you didn't mention them just by letting them out. I don't understand the question. No. Could you, maybe you should ask it in German yeah. and I, I'll have it translated? Yeah. Uh, ich werde es noch einmal versuchen. Sie haben über die Survivors gesprochen, mir auch sozusagen in der Familie überliefert, aus der, aus der Perspektive, die Sie erzählt haben, vor allem in Israel, der Einfluss der Survivors. Aber Sie haben nicht erwähnt, die israelische Gesellschaft, auf die die Survivors Einfluss genommen hätten, weder als Response oder als äh, Widerstand oder als Kritik, äh, das, ist, das wäre meine Frage. Okay, I understand the first part. What is the ja. question? Oh, I see, I see, okay. Uh, you mean um, how, how the Israelis who were not in, this, in the Shoah Absorb the survivors? Yeah, or created, okay. or what was the relationship? Or okay. They were never mentioned just by absence. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first, let me tell you something. Uh, Philip showed you the book. The book is my PhD. And since it was uh, the first ever research on survivors of the Holocaust, I admit I made all possible mistakes. In retrospect, I, can, I admit. What I did was I went to institutionalized archives. I went to the army archive, I went to the kibbutzim archive, to the Histadrut archive, to the Knesset archive. Now, when an establishment tells itself, it's one view. But there is always the most important and difficult thing is to tell the story of an immigration from the eyes of the immigrants. So what I did today is, to a large extent, from the eyes of the immigrants. And I'm telling you because my second book was a story of one of the, of the survivors of the Holocaust uh, organizations. There were 170 organizations of survivors. I didn't speak about the Landsmannschaft because I saw my time is running out. Uh, 170 organizations of survivors of all kinds. And I saw their archives, and suddenly you saw the story of the survivors from the eyes of the immigrants themselves. Now let me tell you about the Israelis. Who were the Israelis in 1948? Basically, there is no such animal as an Israeli society, because the Israeli society is not one-voiced. But in 1948, they were quite one-voiced. 92% of them came from Central and Eastern Europe the same places where the survivors came from. The second is that it was a young society because immigration to Palestine was mostly illegal and many times it demanded the young people and those who don't have familial responsibilities. And the second is how many of them, the third one is how many of them were native Israelis, what we call sabras. Now, there were 450,000 Jews in Palestine at the end of Second, for, Second World War. Of this, a quarter of a million came in the fifth Aliyah, which we call the Yeke Aliyah, mistakenly, by the way, because only one third of it were, were from Germany. But 250,000 came between the years 1933 to 1939. So they themselves, most of them, by the way, from 1936 to 1939, so most of them are new immigrants themselves. By 1945, they were five years in, in the country. That, so that leaves us with another 200,000. This goes to the four Salia and that the, the legendary Sabra, as we describe them, were about 80,000. That's it. So it was basically a meeting point of people from the same background and the same what I called previously Kinderstube. But 
During Second World War, the Jews who lived in Palestine enjoyed the best years of their lives. After Rommel was stopped in El Alamein, Palestine was completely a safe haven. And you think it happened at the end of 1942. In 19, at the end of 1942, the Hungarian Jews, for instance, were still believing that they will make it through the war. Besides which, there was prosperity, economical prosperity in the country. There were even songs about prosperity. So these were great years. The life of the Jews in Palestine went in a straightforward line. From day to day, from an event to event, they were caring for their small things. And the third element you have to take in, into account is the fact that communication is not what we understand in this world today. And basically, the final solution was a secret operation. Yet, by the end of 1942, exactly when Rommel was stopped, 68 Israelis who were in Europe, much to their misfortune, in the, on September 1st, 1939, were brought back to Palestine. We call it the transition uh, a a pact. Because 68 Israelis who were stuck in Europe in the war, because they went to see their grandparents, etc. Remember, very young population. And they came back to Palestine instead of the German uh, citizens of Palestine who went uh, to Nazi Germany, the Templars. And those 68 people who came by the end of 1942 were actually taken out of the ghettos and of, of really on the verge of, of extermination. And they came with the feeling that I got my life back as a gift and what I have to do is I have to tell the people, the Jewish people in Palestine, what was going on. And they spoke and they couldn't stop speaking because they thought it's a mission. And a shift started there, but it was not a dramatic shift because the stories, remember, information and knowledge? Because the stories were so fantastic. How can you believe in 1942 that there is no more Jewish Warsaw? Who can believe such an information? So, People were listening, and the information was so horrible and so b unbelievable, they did not internalize it. Now, later on, when the survivors came, it was a mixed feeling. It was a mixed feeling, first of all, of horror, which was oppressed. I'm telling my students, because they asked me that question, I'm telling my students many times, hadn't they not oppressed this information on the verge of the establishment of the State of Israel? And the information meant that, oh, to, to, we are having the big dream of our lives, a Jewish state, but we have no nation left. For whom are we going to have the state? And besides which, this desperation, of course, would not have allowed them to, to, to stay alive at the war of independence. So there was an oppression of information and of the horror. And then there was also a very strong guilt feeling what did we do in Palestine when they killed our mothers and fathers and sisters? We had the time of our lives. And by the way, the, the guilt feeling was also very prevalent among many survivors. How come my sister died, my mother died, my husband died? How come I survived? What did I do that was not kosher? So this guilt feeling is, is Again, I give a, sem a whole year's seminar about the, this issue of the guilt feeling. So basically, it was a very loaded, sensitive, complex meeting between those whose lives were shattered and between those whose life kept going in a straight line, although they came from the same culture and the same places. There is a big saying by one of the survivors, they spoke. We spoke the language of the survivors of the Holocaust, and they, the Israelis, could not understand our language. 
Between us lay no seas, they said, but oceans of experiences. And it took time to bridge them. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, you told us, you told us how many, uh, how, how the survivors uh, built up a lot of things uh, after the war until I think the Eichmann trial. But and uh, the uh, the lower uh, mega uh, was built up with funds. Uh, with self funds, self financing, self fi findings, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I think not with the support of the government. No, and how many uh, member of the government were survivors? Okay, were the survivors? And the second point uh, I want another thing because you mentioned Murmelstein. Uh, he first he was not asked to be a, uh, te to, to be a testimony to the trial, but also he was afraid to go to Israel because mm -hmm. he said he, he, was, he had the fear to be put uh, to, uh, to trial himself. I don't think... I... That, was he, he, that was his telling in the big interview with Lanzmann. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. I, I, but he was not asked to go. That okay. also. Um, first of all, there was. You can see on. Uh, I'll start with Marmelstein because that's easy. And um, you can see on the documents. I never told you the story about me writing the Eichmann trial book, but we don't have time, I think. Uh, but on the documents of the um, police, which actually created the indictment, they say it's written: we are not looking after him. We don't care where he is. Hilde Hahn, who was his secretary, she testified to everything he did. She testified about, the Eich about Eichmann himself, because most of the trial was not actually, Eichmann had no touch with some of the parts of the trial, but with Theresienstadt, he did. Marmelstein was not a person to be afraid. Marmelstein had a certificate to Palestine. He could use it and save himself and his family. And he decided to stay behind. I mean, he was not a frightening man. He is a, an impressively, and I'm, I'm just now after Marmelstein because I was interviewed in the television about uh, uh, when a landsman was screened in Yom HaShoah, uh, the, the interview with him. It's a one in a lifetime testimony because he's the only Yutzerat, Elterstarat, who survived. Besides which, he's connected to Eichmann. And this is unbelievable. This is completely, but he is not a person to be afraid. And by the way, he was judged in, Czech, in the Czech Republic and he was uh, set free. Yes, he was acquitted. So I don't think he was really afraid to be judged in Israel. And by the way, all the capo sentences, all the capo trials in Israel stopped at the Eichmann trial. There is no any other trial. And I found in the archives um, at least 25 appeals for new trials and they stopped this. This is, by the way, the end of the guilt feelings um, era in the, in the history of the survivors in Israel. Now, you asked me one more question. I got about, oh. You see, I, uh, when I started this research, I have now many PhD students who is doing, there's endless work to do about survivors in Israel. And by the way, also a comparative analysis is due with survivors who went to Germany, survivors who went to the United States, to Australia. I even have survivors of the family in Palermo in Sicily. So they are all over the place. Yes. Uh, this is not what you would think as a first option. Um, and one of my PhD students is doing um, how many parliament members, survivors of the Holocaust, were there, and what did they do as parliament members? There were 91 survivors of the Holocaust who served in the Israeli parliament from the beginning of the 1950s. And how many were members? 
government, we had, I think, about seven in all, all the years, but not at the beginning. Thank you very, very much. Very, very strong political uh, presence. Thank you very much. We're unfortunately running out of time. Before I close to today's event, just one more thing I would like to bring to your attention. The next Simon Wiesenthal lecture is going to be on the 12th of June. Barbara Kirschenbart Giblet from the New York University um, is going to be our next speaker. The title of her lecture will be Rising from the Rubble, Creating the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Thanks for your time and for your attention. I wish you a very nice evening and see you probably at the Fest of Freude in a couple of minutes.